I don't believe that mathematics is real. I think mathematics is a tool that we as physicists use to describe the world. And in this mathematics, we have definitions for things that we call particles. And that might be an excitation in a field, or it might be an irreducible representation of the Lorentz group, or it might be a quantum of energy, and these are all related. And then we know what we're talking about. And that is what I mean by a particle. But are particles real? From Democritus to Einstein, we have assumed the world is made of tiny building blocks of matter. But the more we've looked for them, the more they've disappeared. Our best theory now proposes the world is better described by fields that don't have the familiar properties of physical bits, things or particles. Yet physicists still refer to particles, though few seem to agree on their nature. Some say they approximately exist, and others say that they don't exist at all. Stranger still, there are quasi-particles, phenomena that we can treat as particles and enable us to solve equations, but which we don't know are fundamentally real. And so the opening question is this, are particles real or just a convenient fiction for doing physics? Something nice and passive there. Hilary, why don't you start us off? Thank you, thank you. So I imagine, I may be proved wrong, that the other um, uh, panelists will argue that uh, either particles or fields, possibly information, maybe a combination of them, are behind our, the, the, the nature of the universe. And of course, in the history of mankind or humankind, um, there's been a whole series of suggestions of what might be the underlying stuff of the universe. The Greeks had earth, water, fire and air. Wittgenstein claimed it was fact. Um, uh, idealists uh, often argue that it's uh, consciousness. Some people claim it's mathematics. Uh, but I'm going to perhaps make myself unpopular uh, on the panel by arguing that all of that is a mistake. And um, I imagine that most of you imagine that the world is divided into things. You see people next to you, you see people and a tent and uh, stars and all of that sort of thing. So you imagine that the world is divided into things. It's as if the universe comes to us ready differentiated and what we're doing is naming the parts and maybe how the parts interact with each other and trying to get the right answers. Now, I think that's a mistake. And it's a mistake because the divisions of the world into particulars is not to do with what the world is like, it's to do with how we think. How we think is to divide the world into identities. And uh, that's how we enable anything to happen. And it's also one of the reasons why it's so difficult to catch sight of the mistake. Because everything we do in terms of how we think, we think in terms of identities. We've got no choice. There's no other way of thinking. And uh, so when one is pointing to the fact of, of there being a, a mistake in thinking of the world like that, it's hard to point to it because every way that we think about it, we're carrying those identities. But there are some clues that give us a clue that there's a problem with this notion of things. And the first clue is we can't find an example of a thing. You go looking for a thing and it always turns out it's made of something else. Um, and of course, that's been the story of the atom. The atom was, at least in modern times, was sort of a solid thing that was atom all the way through. And then we discovered, of course, that we can split the atom. And so now there's a whole load of particles within that and, and a whole series of Chinese boxes. So that's true of anything that you look at. It doesn't matter whether it's quarks or whether it's the table, you can't find what the ultimate thing is. And the second thing is that I'd like to point out is everything you can describe as something else. So you think of this as a glass, but it could be a weapon. It could be an example in a talk. It could be a design artifact of the 21st century. There's no limit to the number of ways that you can describe each bit of the world. So those are clues that there's something profoundly wrong with imagining that there's some ultimate bits. And so I'm going to argue to you that there are no ultimate bits that we might be able to find 
But I'm not saying that we shouldn't pursue those accounts of it because they can provide us with effective ways of intervening in the world. Oh, interesting. All right, convenient fiction to start us off. Sabina, what, what's your opinion? Are particles real? Are particles real? Um, so I would describe myself as, as an instrumentalist. I don't believe that mathematics is real. I think mathematics is a tool that we as physicists use to describe the world. And in this mathematics, we have definitions for things that we call particles. And that might be an excitation in a field, or it might be an irreducible representation of the Lorentz group, or it might be a quantum of energy, and these are all related. And then we know what we're talking about. Um, that is what I mean by a particle. But are particles real? I don't know. I'm not sure I know what this even means. This is a question I leave to philosophers. Lucky we've got For one. For me, the interesting question is, are particles fundamental? The particles that we currently know of in the standard model of particle physics, electrons, quarks, photons, and so on, are they fundamental or are they made of something else? And one interesting clue to this is that we do have quasi-particles in materials. They're basically collective motion, something like waves, but with quantum properties. We know that those are made of other things. They're fundamentally made of the constituents of whatever the material is. And of course, that raises the question of the things that we now call fundamental particles in the standard model also ultimately quasi-particles and made of something else. And there are, of course, quite a bunch of approaches to try and find a more fundamental underpinning of the standard model. String theory is probably the best known ones, but there are some others. Uh, and maybe one day we'll find them. Uh, I don't know, but I don't think that it's impossible. Interesting. Okay. Well, Zabina said we need a, a, uh, a philosopher, excuse me, to, to help us unpack that. So, Tim, what do you reckon of this? Okay. So, um, for once, I actually have prepared two minutes. Thank um, you. Five <laughs> points. I hope there was. I, I mean, I'm just putting out the first four. I hope there's no dispute about them. If there is, we need to find that out quickly. Um, so, point one. We'll never know, never know beyond all possible doubt what the world is fundamentally made of. Why? This is empirical science. Empirical science doesn't run on absolute proof. It's some kind of inference from the evidence we have to what we think of as the, the most likely or plausible explanation. If someone says, well, we'll never be absolutely sure, yes, absolutely happy with that, right? Uh, nobody should dispute that. Point two, still, right, even in empirical science, we have hypotheses or theories, if you want to call them that, that can be established by evidence beyond any reasonable doubt, right? Not beyond all possible doubt, but beyond any reasonable doubt. Here are some what, once controversial scientific hypotheses I claim have that status now. The Earth is a sphere. The moon is made of rock. Water is a molecule composed of two hydrogen atoms electrically bonded to a single oxygen atom. There are continental plates that drift. DNA has a double helix form. COVID is caused by a coronavirus, right? Uh, if, if anybody up here wants to say, no, I don't believe one of those, then we have a more severe problem here. The exit is at the back, is, well, what, is no, what Tim is saying then, here. Then there's no point in having the further discussion, because already <laughs> the, the, the disagreement occurs at a much, much... Now we're asking the question, ah, but what about the fundamental physical constituents, right, of nature, the kind of thing we look for in physics? Um, certainly what those are, or if you will, if there are any, although that's a harder question, has not been established in anything like to anything like this degree of certainty or, 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 or probability. So that's an open question. Um, people have made different, throughout the history of, of physics, have made different suggestions uh, that there are particles. So these are suggestions for what John Bell called local beables, that is, physical items that exist in small regions of space-time. So particles, that's a possibility. 
Fields, those are different. Why? Particles are always somewhere. Fields are always everywhere, right? So we can talk about that these are different things. Strings, all right? They're not like standard particles because they have this one, you know, one degree of vibrational freedom. Brains, which have more degrees. Things called flashes, which I could talk about, but are punctate in space and time. These are all proposals that have been made and arguments have been made in their favor and theories have been developed that postulate these things. Tim, yep. I'm afraid we're out of the two minutes. Can I, I, then, let, let, can I just give you one quote? It's Do just it. a quote. This is from John Bell about particles. He was talking about the standard two-slit experiment we all know. He says, is it not clear from the smallness of the scintillation on the screen that we have to do with a particle? And is it not clear from the diffraction and interference patterns that the motion of the particle is directed by a wave? This was motivating a certain theory we can talk about later. Mm. This is the kind of consideration I think we should be talking about. Thank you so much. I mean, okay, so you, you all have very different opinions, it seems. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. With a free trial, you can enjoy the full talk and thousands more. Thank you for being part of the conversation.